I'm very excited about this next presentation. Um, this is a keynote interview, as we like to call them, with our not old friend, longtime friend, Jed Katrancha from Downtown Music Publishing in New York City. Please welcome Jed. Thank you. So thanks for being here. So as, as you all know that we are now, uh, I, I've asked you specifically to come to talk about uh, royalties from streaming music online, which is such a controversial discussion that artists are having all over the world these days. Basically, the question comes down to, should I have my music on Spotify or other streaming services, or should I not? And there is a huge perception out there that it, um, it, it's just, it's not worth it. The, the financial trade-offs are just not fair, and therefore I should avoid being on Spotify. Taylor Swift famously pulled her material off of Spotify uh, so as not to compete with her on record sales. Adele followed suit. Tom York famously has not. Prince. And uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. So just w w we'll talk a little bit later in the discussion about the relative value proposition, should I or shouldn't I? But could you just sort of give us an overview from your perspective in the music publishing industry, working with very high-level artists, how has streaming music affected artists and your company in terms of revenue? Uh, you know, I think that um, one of the things that makes this entire discussion so difficult and controversial is that uh, companies are looking at streaming services and saying, what does this mean to, to us as a company? And, uh, and of course, what we're seeing uh, when you put together our, you know, I work at a small-ish independent company, um, but when you look at our 275 clients and what we're receiving as income and, uh, and the types of problems that we're trying to fix as far as submitting data to the streaming services to make sure that we're not missing a penny, uh, fighting um, b b with all of our partners and colleagues for better rates, we're seeing a bigger chunk of the pie uh, than an individual artist and an individual songwriter who, you know, the questions that you were posing, what does this mean for me individually? Um, it's a very different proposition than, uh, um, than a company saying, what does this mean for us? I mean, the numbers, uh, in, as you said, we're going to talk later about cultural implications and, um, and, and the should I or shouldn't I of streaming. But I mean, the numbers are there. Uh, more money is being um, spent every year and brought in every year and paid out every year by streaming services. Sales are declining. And uh, there's, uh, you know, it's, it's you, we're we're constantly fighting for uh, a bigger piece of the streaming pie, while you know, as you said, acknowledging that it's you know, you know, it, a long time ago eaten into sales. So there are, you know, we see such conflicting information coming out in the news media. You'll see on the one hand that. Um, well, we all know that the availability of online music and streaming music has decimated record sales, but every week it seems there's another headline that comes out in the music industry trades that says streaming is now larger than record sales. Streaming revenues are now larger than, than traditional formats of music. So does that mean that the streaming royalties are also increasing and now that the money that everybody thought that they were missing is now suddenly back? Uh, the money that they were missing is not back, uh, but the revenue from streaming is increasing. Uh, and it's going to increase when more people uh, pay for their streaming service, and that's, that's one of the big challenges right now. Um, you know, we're going to talk in a little bit about what is a stream worth, and, and, it, and you know, it's a question that we can't really answer, but we're going to you know, show, uh, share some information that shines some light on that. Um, but one of the big things that affects a per stream rate is, you know, within any given territory that's uh, doing the accounting, how many paid users there are. And I think that that's, um, you know, that's one of the big problems. There are more people streaming, there's more money being paid out, but there are more people streaming for free. Uh, and 
and, and that's not helping to solve. You mean the like on YouTube, as opposed to paying for the the monthly Spotify subscription? Yes, or even you know, like a paid Spotify user versus a free user, or a paid you know, like premium users versus uh, versus unpaid users. Um, you know, that's one of the factors that goes into the per stream rate on any service. So, theoretically, I mean, well, you you said that you know, the that the rates that are paid from the streaming services are, are they changing? Are the rates still in flux? Is part of the issue that we just don't? I mean, that the industry is still shaking itself out, and we don't know what what the money actually is. Well, there is. Uh, it's not that we don't know what the money is. Um, it's just that there are a lot of factors that go into. I mean, there there are there are pushes to uh, you know. There's a push to alter what the rates will be, uh, what piece of the pie is going to, to, to publishing, what piece of the pie is going to recorded music. But um, just, I guess what I was saying is that there are so many factors that affect uh, what the rate is. It's not that you, know, you can look on you know, any, of these, uh, any of these services sites and they'll explain. Uh, and it, to me, sometimes it can look like, you know, you're reading like NASA reports, uh, but they'll explain to you uh, how they come up with their payment algorithms, and it's not um, there's not a chart saying here's what a stream is worth. Here's it's it is there's so many factors that go into it and affect it, and um, you know what what your what your worth is to the service, what your popularity. Uh, rating is to the service, um, how many paid users versus unpaid users. Uh, there, so it's, um, you know, talk about whether the rate is in flux, it's just every, and, and we'll see it in a little bit, we'll look at, you know, different songs from our catalog and the per stream rate is different, I believe, for every song I sent, or almost every song. Well, one of the things that I've always been confused about in discussions of streaming music is for those of us who started learning about music business type stuff really before the advent of the internet and all that and you know you learn that okay you sign to a record label and as an artist you get your artist royalty percentage of net sales of pieces of plastic and that's one of your revenue streams and as a songwriter you get this mysterious thing called the mechanical royalty and you get 0 0.09 cents or nine one nine one yes yeah. <laughs> uh if a rounding song, error if the song is uh, under five minutes okay yeah. Yeah. and so every time one of your songs on an album sells you get nine cents. Or, or it's manufactured, yeah. Right, and uh, so that's like one of these things that we learn. Um, then along comes iTunes, and they're selling songs for 99 cents. Is the mechanical royalty on an iTunes sale the same as a mechanical royalty for a CD it's purchase? It's 9.1 cents is the mechanical royalty for uh, a digital download, and it's the rate for, and album that's a physical album that's manufactured then how do you calculate a mechanical royalty and is it the same nine cents uh for a spotify stream or a youtube play are you do they pay mechanical no. royalties in it, in, it, it, in is, that same kind of basic structure it is not the same uh for a uh when we're selling an album in whatever format um we are getting paid by um, you know, by the the label, and when you have a, they're paying uh, you the mechanical royalty. They're paying us the mechanical royalty. When you have a digital stream, a digital interactive stream, Inter uh, meaning me the user, I select what song I want to hear. Song to play. Uh, then, as a songwriter, there is a performance royalty, and there's the mechanical royalty. And I think that's something that makes. Um, you know, I was talking to a gentleman that works in our office and handles. Uh, oversees a lot of our YouTube uh, royalties, and he was saying that you know sometimes by like, naming some of these royalty, calling it a mechanical, is making it more confusing uh, no. to to some people. But basically, you're getting your performance royalties on a streaming service from the um, from your performing rights organization, from ASCAP, BMI, CSEC, and you're going to get your mechanical royalty uh, paid through your uh, distributor. 
Uh, on, the, on the recorded music side and on the publishing side, you're going to get your uh, mechanical royalty through either your publishing company, uh, who has a direct relationship with the streaming service, or through the Harry Fox Agency, a, a, a company that exists to, um, to issue mechanical licenses. So for, for money that comes in from, say, Spotify for songwriters is, I mean, so do we, we, should we not be thinking of it in terms of a mechanical royalty like we used to think of it or, pub, or you know, per, public performance royalty that you would get your check from BMI? Is it, is it all bundled into one thing and you have to somehow parse it out or is it just too confusing to try to I, I use those same labels to well, identify? I, I think that it's, um, I kind of look at it like, uh, you know, when I started working in music publishing, which wasn't that long, you know, 15 years ago, uh, you had the, the tape room guy, which by that point in time was somebody who was organizing all of the digital files in their iTunes collection, but they were still calling him a tape room guy because that's what you called your head of audio you know, 25 years ago. It's, you know, it's not a mechanical, because you're not, you're not affixing the copyright to a, you know, to a physical piece of product that's going to be distributed, but uh, you know, for us, we're and we'll see it on the um, on the third thing that we're going to put up. You know, we are collecting. We're dealing with different agents to uh, you know, to collect a public performance royalty, to collect a mechanical royalty for a digital stream, and then we, as a publisher, are giving that money to our clients. And they're in, in a statement where they're able to see where each penny or dollar comes from. Okay. Well, let's look at the visualization that, that you and I talked about. So, okay. Tony, if we could pull the uh, computer up. Okay, great. So, some of you may have seen this. This is from a website called Information is Beautiful. It's been out for a little while now. And so, Jed, could you just kind of walk us through what, what this yeah. graphic is explaining here? I, you know, before coming here, I was talking to different colleagues of mine who, and you know, just to tell you, we're a, you know, we're a traditional music publishing company, but a traditional music publishing company in the year 2016 means that we have as many developers working on our staff as we do people working in a royalties department. Um, and so we have a lot of really smart people and a lot of experts working at the company. And I was asking them for different visuals that might help illustrate a bit of, um, you know, getting to what a stream is worth and, and what are these different, you know, what do you have to do to make money on any of these services? And this is something that uh, came out around this time last year, um, the saying that the U.S. monthly minimum wage is $1,260. So for any different media type in the music industry, what would you have to do? What would you have to sell or stream or share to, uh, to make that amount of money? So the, the first line is, so if you have a CD that is self-distributed by an unsigned artist and you're selling it for a retail price of $12, you have to sell 105 units in order to earn $1,260. That's right. And I think you know, and, one thing I'll And your cut is 100%. That's right. Uh, you know, and one thing I'll mention here is just with, with any, and, and, and really with digital streaming, you know, we're engaging, as I said, we, you know, we have to engage with partners sometimes to extract money from, um, you know, from these services. And through the years, we've developed direct relationships so we can get money faster. You mean you have to hire a collection team? Is that what you mean? We have to hire. We, yeah, and, and we are now forming these direct relationships so that we don't have to do that because we pay them and then the writer makes their money. Um, with any of these things, there's always, that's, that's also a, um, you know, a value proposition is, how much work do you have to do as an unsigned independent artist uh, managing your own business affairs and that's time spent away from building your career and, um, and, and just being the artist. So as we go through here, the, the percent that any artist is keeping is gonna be affected of course by the people who are doing work for you who in theory should be able to get you more impressions or sell more music for you. 
All right, so just scrolling down, and you all can look at it for yourselves, but so if you have a, a record on Bandcamp, that's an album download, and you're an unsigned artist, you need 148 units sold in a month to make that $1,200 minimum wage. Yep. If it's an iTunes album download, and big difference between an unsigned artist and a signed artist. Why does a signed artist need to sell so many fewer copies? Oh, that, well, but one's a single track. All right, that's so, right, yeah. All right, so we'll let... So an unsigned artist needs to sell 1,800 single download units on iTunes in order to make that $1,200 a month. That's right. But a signed artist only needs to sell 547? That's an album download. Oh, album, sorry, yes. my yeah. bad. I yeah. beg your pardon. Okay. All right, let's keep going down here. All right, so for a solo artist to earn the minimum wage of $1,260, on Google Play. Can you explain this one a little bit, Jed? Uh, let's see here. So need 172,000 plays needed in or at what, point zero zero seven three dollars per play. So you need 172,000 plays in order to earn that $1,200. That's right. And an unsigned artist keeps more of the money, so they only need 70,000 plays. That's right. Keep more of the money, but again, you're, you don't have a, a, a marketing and promotion team out there pushing those plays. So. Oh, this is an old slide. They include title. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Somebody got that. <laughs> uh, all right. Let's get that. Ooh, beats on beats. Oh, this is really old. Okay. Yeah. But, um, but a signed artist needs to sell 420... And already, yeah, closing soon. So there you go. This was from yeah. April of last year. So. Right. Rhapsody. Uh-oh. What happened here? All right. Now they have to sell 600,000 units in order to make that $1,200 a month. But an unsigned artist only needs to sell 104,000. Apple Music. A signed artist needs to sell 971 thousand These units streams. So they're streams, not selling. Sorry. They need to, need so to they stream. Need, they, need, so they need that many people clicking on their song or that many clicks on their song to make $1200. dollars That's uh that that's a mi close to a million streams. Yeah. In order to make $1200. Yes. And you need to sell how many records to make that $1200? What? Okay. Yeah. Let's go back. Wait, what was it? You, as an in independent unsigned artist, you need to sell 100 records. And 105, yeah. Okay, yeah, a million streams, no problem. You know, it's it's. I can uh, do that. Well, I think it's it's. Um, and again, I know we're going to talk about this in just a little bit, but you know, if you're an independent artist, um, you know, selling selling a hundred what is one hundred and five albums uh, yeah. as a completely independent artist to make twelve hundred dollars a month. Um, so to make the U.S. Uh, was it U.S. minimum wage? Um, I mean, that's, you're selling a little over 1,200 albums a year. That's tough. That's, that's actually a lot, and that's a lot of work, and if you don't have any, you're gonna eventually have to give somebody some money to do some of the work for you. If it's somebody working the merch table at your show, um, I mean, unless you are like married to or related to your entire team, um, that's, you know, you're gonna give up some of that money somehow and somebody, eventually you're gonna wanna give someone a piece of the pie to promote your music so that you have a bit more of a shot to get to the, you know, I, I'd say that if you are, um, if you're getting a million streams, if you had to choose between having a million streams or selling 105 independent CDs in a month, choose the million streams, of course, because have to assume that you're going to be able to sell more t-shirts, more concert tickets, and I doubt that anybody who's getting a million streams is only selling 105 albums. I'm sure if you're getting a million streams a month, you might be selling more than 105 albums a month as well. Fair enough. So, all right, Spotify, a signed artist needs to sell 1.1, uh, have 1.1 <laughs> million streams clicked on their song at Point zero zero one one dollars per click, and an unsigned artist, one hundred and eighty thousand streams 
to make that same $1,200. Yeah. And they include YouTube as well, which is, oh my Lord, <laughs> 4.2 million YouTube views to make $1,200. And I don't even know what kind of royalties YouTube is paying. Uh, I mean, we'll, we'll see it on the sheet. And okay. It, but, I'm and, now, you and now you think, uh, as a publisher, we're often, we're looking after 25% you know, let's say we have a, one writer um, wrote a song with three other people, we have 25%, and we're only looking after the publishing side of it. So uh, for a lot of these services, uh, the recorded music side is getting a lot more than the publisher is. So you'll see it when we pull up what, um, you know, what 30 million streams is worth for us on a song. Um, it's a lot less than... That's crazy. It's a lot less than this, yeah. So an unsigned artist needs... 700,000 streams on uh, views, I guess, on YouTube in order to make $1,200. So there's a New Orleans rap artist named uh, D1 yeah. who came out with a song recently called Sally Maybach that was all the buzz because he had over 3 million views in the first week. Yeah. So that's not qu quite 4.2 million. So it's safe to say that he didn't quite make his $1,200 in in YouTube royalties. Who, that well, month. who who um, who distributes his music? RCA. Oh yeah, no. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Just saying. Okay. Um, all right. We're gonna. I want to save time for questions here, but let's look at this other file that you sent us. So can you? I imagine he's getting radio. Uh, well, we, yeah. Yeah. We'll talk. All right. So, okay. so le he's let's let's okay. try not to make folks' eyes glaze over too much, and then let's start t talking into the is it is it yes. worth it or is it not <laughs> worth it? But can you just kind of explain what this is? Because I am absolutely. I, what baffled. I shared is a um, is a redacted uh, Spotify statement, one of our monthly Spotify statements. Um, and so that the numbers were a little bit easier to look at, I took out every song that we don't have 100% uh, of. So every, the royalty amount associated with the number of streams is real. We, we, so, so this first column, units, that's streams. streams. So this is listens, basically, or yes. spins. Spins. From an ancient era. That's right. Okay, got it. At a royalty rate of cheesem. Point zero zero one one seven seven dollars. So that's a hundred pretty uh, pretty high. So that's basically Compared not quite a penny, or maybe a little bit over a penny. No, uh, no, no that's, that's less than a penny. That's, Sorry, yeah, that's a tenth of a penny. A tenth of a penny. Yeah, we ended up uh, for those twenty eight plays, um, we got uh, three cents. Well, that's a bargain. Yeah. Is that in the form of a check? Uh, <laughs> It's a, it's a direct deposit, which, uh, yeah. Okay, so, so looking at, so, so what should we learn from this? Let's just scroll down and see if we can find a big number in terms of plays. So these are all different clients of yours and how many plays they're getting on Spotify, basically. Yeah. And you can see in uh, column H, there's a... Uh, column H. Um, oh. you, know, you can see if it's a, a free play versus a premium play. Okay, and is there a difference? In the rate, that's the uh, th there is a difference in the rates. All right, I'm looking for somebody that. All right, so here's somebody, nearly twenty thousand plays at a, a seventh of a penny. Is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So okay. fourteen dollars and seventeen cents. That so fourteen dollars and seventeen cents. Interesting. I pulled up um, before coming down here. Uh, you know, and, and, and just so you know, some of these, these aren't all different songs. Some of these are different um, line items for this. Okay. So you have 20 of these could be for the same song. All right. All right, let's look at this right quick. So Santa Gold is one of your artists. Yep. One of your writers. One of and, our writers. Yep. Yeah, and so she has a song called Disparate Youth that's very popular on Spotify. 47 million plays of this song. Yeah. Um, I mean, without giving away too much of her personal business, I mean, is there a rule of thumb? If I'm an artist and I know that I've got 47 million plays on Spotify, is there a way of, of, of you know, back of the envelope saying, well, okay, my check from Spotify is going to be $11? Uh, 
it's it's a little tougher than that, but um, I, w- I mean, it would be more than eleven dollars for for the forty seven. Oh, 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 that's such a relief. <laughs> yeah, okay. I would. Uh, I would. Um, I mean, might even be in the hundreds. Ooh. Okay. I, but you know, what, and I like when we um, you know, we were talking about this just before the panel started sitting up here, and I, I mentioned Santi, one of our writers, and um, and it's not the point of this panel. I'll only mention this quickly, but we. You, one of the big things that we do and it's an incredibly lucrative thing that we do for our songwriters is uh, we pitch their music for sync licensing. And that song was in a big commercial. If you played it, anyone who maybe would think they don't know the song, if you played it for three seconds and you say, oh, I, I, I've heard that song on, a, on TV before. And that drove the views. So I, I really, I look at... Um, you know, I look at our relationship with a lot of this income as, you know, we are doing other marketing initiatives that are more lucrative, and we're driving, um, you know, we're driving some of these spins. Okay, so you guys are out there, and these things are happening because um, you are out there actively getting those songs better known in the in in the world at large that's right okay and then there are you know there, there, there are the the evergreen hits which kind of work for themselves but, you know, so what I did is I shared a I shared a sheet um, with uh, with Scott where we I looked at four different services we looked at Spotify Pandora Rhapsody and YouTube and took, I took nine different songs and uh, you know, and for uh, three different pay periods. So there's look, your ASCAP money, your BMI money on Pandora. Yep. And on YouTube, ASCAP, BMI. And then to, our, our mechanical license, which we, um, you know, we have a direct relationship with Google. All right. So, here, so we're on YouTube here. So, um, and HFA is the Harry Fox agency, which collects mechanical licenses. And okay, so this is a song, song A, and it has 16 million views, views. on YouTube, and that generates $1,800 in revenue in mechanical royalties. In mechanical royalties. So just that one royalty stream, and that's from the, uh, all right. And if you scroll... Um, Back up? Uh, no, if you scroll over to the, uh, okay. to the right for that same song... Oops, hold on. Um, we have 14.16% of the publishing on that song. Uh, so if you want to, if you want to uh, take it to what that song earned at 100%, it was, uh, you know, combining these different pay periods, even though we're seeing, you know, $1,400, $1,500, $4,700, it's, it's a little bit more when you take it to, to, to so this thirty three thousand dollars that's in just this in, just in mechanical royalties so just whoops, in mechanical whoops, royalties for those uh, for those three pay periods okay so that gives you a sense of how much money is actually in play that's right well and then if you go up um, just above that is the performance money that that same song made okay uh, so I believe that uh, that was song a so then you have another um, you know almost five thousand dollars in performance. Uh, so combine that with the 33, and you know, we're talking about around 38,000 hours over those three pay periods for the publishing, uh, and then separately there's the, um, you know, there's the, the, the master money as well. Okay, got it. So it's not it's not well, nothing. I say I got that's it. One I song. have no it's, idea what we're talking. About. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, I, and, and, and I know we talked about this on the phone, and you know, before coming here, I talked to you know, some of the experts at our company and uh, people who, whose sole job function is to spend all of their time dealing with these exact things. And I talked with people at other companies, and they, uh, um, you know, there was a lot of, I don't know, I, I would look at different statements and ask questions, and, you know, why are things this way? Uh, you know, we put together some information last week, and I was asking a lot of questions. They were like, "You know what? Maybe don't include that song. It's, it's there are too many exceptions. It's too confusing. Take that song off." So, you know, I, I think it's um, well. The, the it, point there's a reason why people are 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 it, it is it is confusing. 
<laughs> well, I mean, I found it to be extraordinarily revealing when, when you t told me privately and uh, that you have a company with a really serious professionals that deal with this stuff on a day in and day out basis and really kind of, un they put these numbers together and they understand what they all represent. And when you have a meeting with the f staff at your company and you say, well, what do these numbers mean? And they're like, I don't know. I mean, well, that's yeah, I think what, it, what was happening is, uh, you know, I was asking questions about very specific points and, um, you know, one person was like, well, you know, I think maybe this is, this is why it is. And somebody else would ask, you know, say, well, I, I think actually this is, this is why this happened. But, you know, the, the you know, when you, tough thing with some of these numbers, of course, you're looking at a pay period and you, like number of streams. I mean, one thing I didn't point out is that the number of streams for the same song, if you look at performance and mechanicals, uh, was, uh, is different. They say, well, why aren't the streams for the songs exactly the same? You get paid at a different rate depending on the income streams. So you're getting paid next month for, you know, for one income stream, for the exact same, for that exact same stream, you'll get your mechanicals at one time and you'll get your performance money later. So, uh, you know, so we're not always able to line up an experience and make it a one-to-one -one, you know, articulation on a statement. Is, is a big part of the issue and why everything is still so much in flux in terms of what these numbers are and what they mean and our ability to comprehend these numbers that things are still just very rapidly changing on the inside of the industry? Because I remember you and I had breakfast about three years ago and I asked you about a lot of these same things and, and it, you said, you know, we're just not getting statements that we can understand from these services and we don't know what they're paying or what they're paying it on and, and it's, it's not like the statements from the record labels used to be and it seems like things haven't really progressed that You know much. what, I think, I think um, if you go to Spotify's website, uh, you know, they, they're under the most fire, I would say. You know, when you hear people talking about it, when you see the, the news story, uh, you know, like, hey, I had a million streams, you know, you, and you see it both ways. I had, I had 40 million streams and I made a few thousand dollars. Uh, and then there's uh, the, I can't remember the artist from Nashville who, I, we talked about it on the phone. There's an independent artist who um, ended up on a playlist, like some like best of coffee house music playlist. And he did a press piece saying, well, I made $53,000 off of a million streams. Um, you know, Spotify is usually the, you know, the, the company that people are talking about in these press pieces. And so they've been forced into some level of transparency. I think their website's great as far as explaining like, as best as they can where the money goes. And like I was saying at the very beginning, um, you know, for a company, when you're looking at how much money you're making off of these services, our concerns are you know, our concerns are going to be a little bit different, and what we're trying to fix is a little bit different than the individual artist who, who um, you know, we're we're because we're getting money uh, that we're then dispersing to a lot of different writers. The money that's coming in is is bigger. What we're trying to, you know, if we fix something and we up the income by a little bit of you know, like a, a few percentage points, it's a greater gain for us than an individual artist who is the one who's sitting at home saying, you know, tw I 25,000 streams and I just made $6. What's that, you know? So a lot of us have probably seen the news stories of people like Pharrell who had the song Happy, which I think most people are familiar with. It's one of the more popular songs of the last few years and probably had, I don't know, 100 million plays across the various platforms or something like that and the news story comes out he makes like what forty five hundred dollars yeah. in royalties and that was probably somewhat misleading but i've had conversations with local jazz musicians who are unsigned independent artists who will say i'm not putting my music up on spotify it's a total ripoff and right. then I'll, there are very well-known jazz musicians who i won't name uh here but who are grammy winners and are used to a little bit older used to the more traditional side of the music business and uh, an opportunity came up to speak at a Spotify function and this particular artist said, I won't do it because I'm mad at them because my checks are so small. I used to get X from my record company and now I get a, a fraction of a fraction of X yeah. from Spotify. Yesterday, we had a panel here with Christian Scott and Jamison Ross yeah. and Christian gave an extraordinarily articulate attack 
on Spotify and, th- and went into chapter and verse on why Spotify is bad and why we should not be um, allowing ourselves to be ripped off in such a way. And then I said, Christian, is your music on Spotify? He said, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, I think that's, I mean, just show of hand, um, who in the audience uses Spotify? So, you know, it's almost everyone, you know, and, and if not Spotify, who uh, listens to music on YouTube? Who has pulled up videos on YouTube because you want to hear a song? So, I mean, I think that this, that's a pretty important thing to pay attention to. If you Let wanna, the record reflect that nearly every so, hand went up. So, yes, sorry, yes. <laughs> um, you know, I think that that's something uh, that any artist needs to think about and, um, you know, and weigh against you know, what else you have going on. Uh, yeah, you know, I mentioned Prince earlier, and um, you know who is you know, my all-time favorite artist, and somebody who I've spent uh, many, many years uh, you know, collecting his unreleased material and all these things. And I've been frustrated uh, with over the years with um, my inability to access his music online. I mean, I've paid a hundred dollars annual fee more than once to join his web clubs and then they go away or and they you know, to have that not you know have that music not on YouTube it's a really interesting thing to think about after you know what unfortunately happened on Thursday um, but because the music is what it is because we're talking about songs that carry so much weight um, he, he passed away at around one o'clock Eastern time on Thursday uh, so by midnight that night, uh, he had the number one, two, seven, fourteen, seventeen, thirty-three album on the chart for that week. It took him, you know, what, what is that? Eleven hours. It took him eleven hours to outset to sell, you know, a quarter million albums. So even in passing, he to some extent proved his point of why being on those services isn't worth it for him. Um, and I, you know, you know, like I, it, it you know, feels crass to use him as an example even, but you think about 10 years from now and um, you know, my mom standing in the back holding my six month old son and like, where is he gonna experience some of this music? And um, you know, we, we talked about a, you know, a story, I was, there was a New Orleans artist um, who, I was, uh, who I went to go see in New York. And it was, I, I think it was like, like Oscar night or something like that. Well, like, was it the most packed room? But there were people there. It was a, like a cold New York night. People there checking out the show. It was great. And there was a couple in front of me. And the woman said to the guy who she was with, she's like, who's this guy again? He told her. And she took out her phone and saved two of his albums uh, on her Spotify app. And I was saying, <laughs> like, there you go. Like, if he wasn't there, if he wasn't a part of that conversation, you know, you can make a, like a, a like a, you can make a like an immediate A to B and say, well, I'm not on the streaming service, so I sold five and I sold five more albums because of it. I sold 20 more albums because of it. And you're right, you would have made more money that day. But you're removing yourself from a conversation. Um, if somebody writes about you, if somebody tells someone else, hey, go check out this artist, that you're not where they are, um, you know, then I think you're you're at a real disadvantage. You know, I was talking to a friend of mine who's working on a TV show right now and he was picking out music for it. Um, and this is a bigger artist that I'm gonna mention, but he was listening to the New York Dolls music thinking that it might be right for the show he was working on. And, um, and he was like, oh yeah, like Buster Poindexter. Like that wasn't the guy from New York Dolls, Buster Poindexter. So he was streaming him, he went to stream him and because Spotify was pulling local show dates, he saw that Buster Poindexter was playing at City Winery and bought a ticket, and I, you know, I got in town yesterday. He sent me a picture last night from the show and said, wow, I had so much fun. So he probably spent um, you know, maybe, maybe $40 on that ticket. He spent $40 on Buster Poindexter because Spotify reminded him that he liked that artist. And I mean, I guess whoever wrote Hot, Hot, Hot probably also made maybe a penny. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's, it's like these are these these uh, these platforms. As the show of hands showed, I mean, I, I didn't raise my hand, but I was an audio guy, so it took me a little while to get to Spotify. But now I'm Spotify every day. Um, 
you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm YouTube every day. And, uh, and when artists aren't there, when they pull their material from these places, um, because I'm listening to so much music, I, I think I'm different because I, because I listen to so much music and because I come from another generation, I'll buy the music. Um, but even then, if they're not on, sometimes if they're not on Spotify, it's because something's out of print, so I'm buying it used anyway, so it's, you know, it's just helping a used record store. Let's open it up for questions and see what y'all want to know about. Hello, John. Hi. Um, uh, thanks for uh, this uh, plethora of information. Um, I, uh, yeah, I wanted to um, mention that it's really interesting to me that there is a level of um, standardization that was talked about in the conversation here. We talked about mechanical rates being 9.1 and then performance royalties. And I'm wondering about the history of standardization in the music business. Like, how did uh, mechanical royalty become standardized? Because I see so much variability in everything you're presenting in terms of the rates that artists are getting. So I'm just wondering why those things got standardized and how they got standardized. Uh, you know what, I might not be the best person to answer, honestly, uh, as far as the history of, of of some of these rates and um, uh, and the motivations behind some of these uh, some of the standardization. I, it, to be honest, I spend most of my time uh, on a side of the industry where nothing is standardized, and that's sync licensing. Or I won't say nothing. The performance royalties derived from it are, but um, you know, as far as the history goes, I, I, there there are people I know who could give you a really interesting answer to that question and, and walk you through everything and. Um, if we connect afterwards, I'll, I'll, I'll point you in their direction. Let's get a yeah. couple of more questions in. A couple of folks wearing purple. Everybody yeah. got their, yeah. our, our logo is purple. There you uh, go. Uh, yeah. So one of, the, uh, one of my biggest pet peeves about streaming services is that when I pay $9.99 a month, my money gets thrown into this big pot, right? Yes. And <laughs> uh, when I walk into a record store, and I purchase a record, that money doesn't get spread out evenly amongst all the records in the store. Uh, so for someone like me who maybe uses Spotify, maybe I listen to 100 songs in a month, right? My set, if you take the 30% away for, the, for Spotify, now we've got $7 to play with uh, between the rights holders. So if you split up $7 between 100 streams, then you're looking at an effective stream rate of about seven cents or uh, per stream. So, you know, why is it, and is that uh, that my money gets thrown into this big bucket as opposed to going directly to the artist that I stream and goes to artists that I don't listen to? And is that something that, you know, you feel could, uh, there could be a change in that sort of per user uh, model as opposed to just throwing it into a big royalty bucket? Yes, um, you know, I, 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 you know, I was saying it earlier, but I think that that's, I know that that's one of the big uh, problems that we're trying to solve is um, how to get more paid users. You know, because that was one question I didn't ask, show of hands, I know that everybody's using these services. Who pays for Spotify? So, so a few less people, not, 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 not all of the hands. Um, it's, I mean, j j the, the short answer is that that's one of the problems that we're trying to fix is how to push for more paid users. Um, as far as uh, moving towards a system where if your music is streamed by somebody who didn't pay, um, do you get nothing for that stream? I, I don't, I, that's, that's not, um, I don't think that helps the, the ecosystem as a whole. But, um, again, let's. We, we should. We uh, you know, full disclosure. We we share a client, so uh, we'll we'll talk quite a bit more about this. <laughs> Two quick questions. I generally watch live performances on YouTube, and how does that work with um, like the ASCAP BMI share of publishing? It's like a live concert uh, video. And then my other question is, what's your perspective in the streaming services over singles versus albums? Are albums still a relevant? work of art? Is it better for artists to focus on doing like a really good song and releasing that when that's ready rather than waiting until you have 10 songs for an album? Uh, you know, I mean, I'll, it's, I think that that's up to the artist as far as what your artistic statement's going to be. Uh, it's, I, 
I love the album as a statement, and you know, I, it's funny we because he was a big part of uh, Sync Up last year. Sturgill Simpson is a songwriter who very lucky to work with, and I mean, he just released his new album last week, and, which is insane. Yeah, and and um, and I and it would have been the number one album um, it, had Prince not passed away, but Prince is number one and two. Uh, you know, that I don't think that there's anything I mean, where he, you know, he made this, um, you know, so it's, it's, it's successful. It, you know, it's going to be the number three album in the country. Um, it's, there's going to be a huge tour, but I wouldn't be surprised if it gets nominated for album of the year in the Grammy. Like who, who knows? Um, he wrote that album as a, as a, 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 a suite of songs uh, to his son and, I don't think he thought at all about the the business side of uh, any implications of how, you know should I wait or should I, like how do we re he he made what he made and then the album the the label um, Atlantic rolled it out as they saw fit in collaboration with him and his marketing ideas um, you know as far as live shows when you uh, you know, the, the the rights that are associated with a YouTube video. There's the, uh, the owner of the video, the owner of the, when there's a piece of music on there, 50% you know, is the video, 35% is the master recording, 15% is the copyright. If it's a live recording, there's no master, so it's 50% is the video owner, 50% is, uh, is, the, is the publishing. So uh, we, we love live videos. You know, a little bit more. Another question. Yeah, and one thing I'm going to say very qu quickly, I'm sorry, is uh, you know, when you're talking about YouTube videos, it's also uh, like every other service. We say it's, you know it's you're not getting paid just by number of streams. You can have multiple videos that have the same number of streams that bring in very different amounts of money. Um, you know, engagement, uh, number of comments, uh, like how long someone watched the video for, uh, like how many. Uh, subscribers, the person who hosted the video has on their channel. There are so many things that uh, affect the uh, the rate. Yeah. I have a question. Yep. Duh. Um, in urban music, sometimes there are mix shows in which songs go on the radio that don't in queue that don't get a performance royalty. Um, I have a song right now that has been playing on the BBC four times in the past week. Um, are all those songs reported and gain a, are all those songs reported and do they gain a performance royalty? Uh, you're talking about radio? Yes. Um, was a song, and you're saying it's a, it gets a, but, and the song exists as a copy, like the song is a registered copyright? Yes. Okay. Then, uh, and what stations are playing the song? One Extra. What's the BBC One Extra. Okay. Mean, uh, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not so up on, uh, like what the royalty rate is, uh, over, you know, for, for yeah. BBC, but, but yes, there's, I mean, there's, there are royalties for radio play. Yes. Okay. No, yes. just this, the reason why I ask is sometimes you have like DJs that are, that work for radio stations that play a personal mix. And sometimes those songs don't incur a royalty because it's a mix show. The mix show, exactly. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But this song is actually logged. They track it when it's playing. The artist is registered. The artist is signed to a major label. I just wanted to know if there's a pot for me. Yeah. All right, cool. Yes. <laughs> okay. Good answer. There you go. <laughs> Hi. Uh, where's the musicians' union in all this? Are they... Uh, collective bargaining with uh, Amazon and Spotify, and you know, is there? Are you know they what? Active? Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm more. Uh, uh, you know, obviously, I'm I'm coming at it from the publishing side. Um, you know, when there is for for non-interactive streams, um, you know, there there is there is a an artist royalty, and uh, and there is also a royalty. What is the um, what is the organization? Uh, sound Exchange? Well, no, it, it, Sound Exchange is paying 50% uh, to the recording, 45% to the featured artist. That other 5% of the pot is being, um, it's the, I, uh, it's, there's an organization that deals with AFBM and, and SAG and AFTRA 
uh, that's collecting 5% of that pot for non-featured like, session musicians and, and, and background, uh, you know, like background vocalists. Uh, so th there is a royalty there, and there is an organization to be in touch with about it. And I can, I, like, you, you have, yeah. It just seems like someone needs to be advocating on behalf of, like, like Tim was saying, you know, instead of dividing the pie among all the different artists that are streamed on like Spotify instead of like who's lobbying Congress to change the laws to to make it more equitable for actually you know distribution for the, you know you're paying nine dollars a month for Spotify and you know the, the you, want, you want your money to go to the yeah, yeah. right um, well and that's and that I was so I'm hearing it as two different questions because as far as the artists the the like the performers and the unions uh, that's one thing, and then as far as, you know, because the money, when you're talking about Spotify and the interactive stream, um, I mean, that money's getting divided up between the labels and the publishers, and the, whereas the artist royalty lives more on the non-interactive side. Well, let's leave it up to Congress. They'll fix it for sure. Uh, definitely. <laughs> yes. All right, well, I'm afraid we're out of time for this. I would love to get deeper into this, but uh, please give it up for Jed Katransrubik, Downtown Music Publishing. <laughs>